All right, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Jamie Fitch. I am the sustainability manager for the town of Scarborough. Um, and thank you for coming to the Higgins Beach neighborhood meeting for um, our vulnerability assessment. This is an amazing turnout. I don't think we expected to have this many people between in-person and online. So thank you all for um, taking the time to join us tonight. Um, so just to give a little bit of an overview about the, um, the vulnerability assessment before I turn things over um, to Leela, our consultant from GEI. Um, so this is a process that um, we started in the spring, but the town council authorized the funding for it in um, fiscal year 24's budget, so about a year ago. Um, so this is something that has been um, in, in process for a little while now, um, and just wanna make clear, it's not a response to the January storms. I think the January storms um, just showed us very much that this is something that the town needs to be looking at and um, our community needs to be looking at. Um, so this is kind of the first step in um, improving Scarborough's resiliency to flooding. We are looking um, town-wide, so not just at Higgins Beach, we're looking all around the marsh um, and all of our beach communities and anywhere uh, where coastal flooding is going to impact the town. Um, and Scarborough has a lot of low-lying areas. So we're finding a lot of the town is going to be impacted um, by future flooding from sea level rise and um, storms. So um, this is our first neighborhood meeting. Um, we will also be hosting a neighborhood meeting um, for Pine Point residents later this month. Um, so thank you for being our guinea pigs. And I apologize <laughs> if we have any technical issues and ask you to bear with us. Um, and just to give a sense of where things go once the assessment is done, this is really our first step to understanding where um, our challenges are going to be. Um, there's going to be many more steps that follow. We're going to need to um, complete engineering designs and permitting so that we can begin addressing some of these areas. Uh, there will need to be budget allocations um, and grant funding um, and things like this. So this is going to definitely be um, a many year, um, year process. Um, so this is something that you're going to be hearing about for um, quite a while. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Leela, who will um, do a little bit of an introduction to um, what we're looking at with the vulnerability assessment and the data that's going into that, and then talking specifically about some of the challenges here at Higgins. Great. Um, let me share my screen, and then I will stand up. So that everyone let me throw see. this. Hold on, not everyone can see here yet. I need to get you over. All right, hold on. See, this is one of those technical difficulties <laughs> I was talking about. <laughs> People on Zoom can see us. There we go. Okay, I'll stand over here. I'll use my little mouse as my guide. Thank you for coming. Um, we love to see the enthusiasm. I love such a big group. Can you speak up, please? Yes. <laughs> My name is Leela Pike. I'm a civil engineer at GEI Consultants in Portland. I'm here with a few colleagues of mine, Amanda Barnett, Elon Gasco, and Lisa Vickers. Later in the event, we will be breaking out into breakout groups with tables to have some small discussions. So there'll be some of us leading those tables. And we may tap into some other volunteers because there are quite a few people here today. So I'll give a, um, a brief background of the project as a whole. Oh, Autumn. Just speak okay. okay, yeah. I'm gonna go stand closer. <laughs> Leela, if you want, you can go like, at that tape, set your to be up here on that tape. Okay. I'll just solar. Okay. Just don't want to block anybody's view. 
think I'll share them. All right. So we have done a previous presentation that gave more of a background of the project as a whole and how we're looking at flood risk. And so I may direct you to look back at that if you have detailed questions. Tonight, we really wanna dive into flood risk at Higgins and start brainstorming what the future could look like here so that we can adapt to flood risk. So the overall project, townwide in Scarborough, our goal is to understand coastal flood risk, so flood risk due to storm surge and sea level rise, to prioritize infrastructure for adaptation, to provide some adaptation options to the town, to introduce a few pilot projects. So a few places in Scarborough might come to the forefront of we want to we want to start looking at that now as part of this project we'll bring some concept designs forward and throughout this we're going to try hard for community engagement photos so this is the January 13th storm at Higgins Beach so here is a photo of Bayview Ave on a sunny day and here it is during the storm that occurred in January. A lot of you may have been here or have seen this picture. Um, and as Jamie mentioned, this project is not in response to that. We were developing the scope of the town before this happened. So it was just another reason why we know that this project is so important. And this was the aftermath of that storm. So there was some pretty significant damage that occurred at that road. And um, the other important Damage to note was to the pump station, which I'm sure you were all aware of, that pump station needed to be repaired significantly. And that was a sewer pump station? Yes, yeah, the sewer district pump station. Here's, um, you're not gonna be able to read this text, so I will read it to you. Uh, this is just a map of Higgins Beach to point out some of the areas we'll be discussing. We have the Bayview Ave revetment. So that is where we saw that damage at that road in January. Um, the pump station is back here. So it really sees flooding that comes in from behind from the Spurwink River, which is over here. And then there are a couple of roads um, outside of the small Higgins neighborhood, which are still important to Higgins resiliency, and that is Ocean Ave and Spurwink Road. Both of those roads are prone to flooding and would affect the community here. Sand dunes. So this is somewhat of a hot topic that will affect flood adaptation that can occur at Higgins. Sand dunes are up and down the coast of the country, not just Maine, um, they are dynamic in, in nature. So if there wasn't any development or roads or houses, the sand dunes are constantly shifting with time. They're migrating offshore, they're coming onshore, they're moving eastward, they're moving westward. Here's a photo of Higgins in the 1960s. And um, it's a little hard to see, but all of this dark area here, so that is sand dune, vegetated sand dune that's um, C word of faith you have. That is no longer present today. Today we just have that revetment, beach sometimes, and then the ocean. And then as you move east, we have um, there used to be a parking lot and the Silver Sands Hotel. And now um, there's not much that's there anymore. So that is a change that we've already seen in this area. I'll just read this out loud. So sand dunes, if undisturbed, sand dunes migrate back and forth across beaches, moving inland or beachward as prevailing winds move sands around. When development occurs near dunes, the area that could supply sands becomes reduced. The system becomes no longer dynamic. The protective ability of the sand dunes is diminished. 
So the reduction of sand dunes that we have seen at Higgins reduces that flood protection, that wave attenuation that historically was there and isn't there as much anymore today. Sand dune maps. So the Maine Geological Survey maps sand dunes up and down the state. Sand dunes can be designated as frontal sand dunes or back sand dunes. And the difference has a little bit of difference in what that means in terms of regulations. So I want to just point out where sand dunes are for Higgins. A huge portion of the Higgins neighborhood is mapped as a sand dune. And that is important when we start talking about flood adaptation. Quick question, are these online? Are yes, slides? you can look, uh, oh, the slides will be. They will online. be, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and those sand dune maps are also online. You can look up the main geological survey and take you a look. have a microphone. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'll try to speak louder. My husband speaks so loudly and I need to <laughs> get that. <laughs> Okay, sand dune restrictions. So I'm going to give a summary of highlights for projects that are allowed or not allowed in designated sand dunes. The rules are pages and pages and pages long. So there are always like small exceptions or if you do this or if you look at it this way. So. They are complicated, but here are the high hit points that I want to convey to you all. So projects that are not allowed in sand dunes, new seawalls, and that includes sloped barriers constructed out of rocks, wood, concrete, or similar materials. So no new seawalls. Expanded road footprints. So if you were to elevate a road, you then have to slope that road back to the existing grade. That would be increasing the footprint. If you don't increase the footprint and have a wall, then you have a seawall. And that is not allowed. So that is not allowed in a sand dune zone. Closed fences um, and in frontal dune zones and mapped V zones, FEMA V zones, which is the area that is a frontal zone in Higgins, um, no new structures or additions to existing structures with some exceptions. Here are some projects that are allowed. Pile or post foundations. So um, elevating a structure on piles. Replacement of patios, decks, driveways, walkways, porches, or parking areas moving an existing seawall landward, so farther away from the beach, um, or replacing an existing seawall. So same location and dimensions, including height. You can't make it bigger, but you can replace what's there. Temporary structures. So structures that are in place for up to seven months out of the year, that would be allowed in a sand dune zone. Repair of up to 50% of an existing structure. If it's beyond 50% repair, then there may be some restrictions on that. Um, elevated boardwalks, open fences, walkways, and driveways. So this would be if you have a sand dune and you want to get to the beach, you could make like a perpendicular elevated boardwalk to get over that sand dune. Um, Beach nourishment, sand dune restoration. So anything to um, help sand dunes grow and exist, that would be um, allowed. And the rerouting of road from a frontal dune zone to a back dune zone. So that would also be allowed. Okay, so now I'm going to show some maps, some preliminary maps. These maps show flood inundation, and these are based on the inundation scenarios that we are including in this study 
And for more details of those scenarios, I would refer back to the previous presentation. There will also be a report and a story map as part of this project. So you will be able to read more about those flood scenarios there, but I will just touch on them briefly right now. So the previous presentation was the July? Is that oh, the one you're- In August. August. Yeah, yeah, just last one, okay. Yeah, and, and that video is available online. People can watch it online. So. Oh, good, okay. Yeah. Near term flooding. So this map, is reflective of the elevation of water from the January 13th event. So this is what we saw. So there is flooding, a pretty significant area in Higgins. Um, there are two things, well, there are multiple things shown on this map. One is just standing water flooding. So the elevation of the water without any waves. That is the light blue filled in area. We also have, and there are printouts here that we'll have at each table so you can look at these closer. We also have a hashed area. That shows an area where waves are expected to occur. So where standing water might not cause flooding, but the heavy waves that come will cause flooding. So Bayview Ave, for example, that's one spot where just the standing water alone won't cause flooding, but there is significant waves that will. Also on this map, we have the sand dune areas shown in red is the frontal dune and yellow is that back dune. Oh. So now we'll move to 2050. And then, then we'll show 2100. And for each of these future scenarios, there will be two maps. One that shows what flooding during the king tide would look like. So that would occur maybe twice a year, maybe four times a year, just uh, extra high tide due to the, the lunar cycle, but not due to a storm surge. So it's higher than you would see every day, but you might see it every month. So that we're calling that high tide flooding and then we'll show the storm flooding. And this is for one and a half feet of sea level rise. 1.5 feet of sea level rise. So here we have the high tide flooding for 1.5 feet of sea level rise. This doesn't include wave action. This would be for a sunny day, but the tide is extra high. So really the area here that we're showing flooding is um, back by the Champion Street area, coming in more from the Spur Wink side, the back side of Higgins. And now I'll show 2050 as a storm event. So this is reflective of the January 13th storm with 1.5 feet of sea level rise. The January storm was 3.5 feet surge. I think it was about three point. The total elevate the elevation was nine point three feet. If I backtrack the math, yeah, I think it was about three and a half feet of surge. Yeah, so this would be an additional one and a half feet, and you could see what that flooding would look like if we had that January storm with one and a half feet of sea level rise. One and a half feet of sea level rise is what the state of Maine is saying that towns should commit to managing by 2050. And then on there, we also have that hashed area, which is showing where wave action would occur. Because again, the light blue is just showing standing water flooding without waves. And then we sh have shown where waves would likely occur. Okay, 2100. So here is where we're looking at four feet of sea level rise for this high tide flooding. So again, king tides, maybe twice a year, maybe every other month for four feet of sea level rise. And this is what would be expected at Higgins uh, without any additional wave action and without a storm event but for four feet of sea level rise. And the last map I'm showing is really like 
the worst case scenario that we're looking at. So it's the higher rate of sea level rise in 2100, 7.4 feet, plus the largest storm event we're looking at, a 500 year storm. So worse than the January storm. So this is just like, you know, for worst case scenario, that's what we would see for the Higgins neighborhood. And again, I have all these printed maps. So I want to just move on to start talking about adaptation because the maps I know look dire. There are options for adaptation. And that's what we're here to brainstorm. We are not during this meeting deciding on how it will be adapted. We are here to think about all the possible ways to hear what you all as residents of Higgins would want to see and thoughts and ideas that you have had. So here's a brief summary of adaptation concepts and then I'll get into some more examples. So in general, um, what we have is no response. So do nothing, keep your house where it is and then it may get flooded when flooding happens. Um, B top right is advance. That's not something that happens today, but historically that would be, um, you know, downtown Portland, they've put a lot of fill near Commercial Street to create Commercial Street. That's really advancing into the water. That would not fly by regulatory agencies. So it's not really an option. Um, protection. So a protection would be to build some sort of barrier or seawall to prevent the water from coming. Because of the sand dunes, at Higgins, seawalls are not really an option here, new seawalls. Retreat, so retreat would be moving infrastructure away from flood risk. Accommodation would be letting the water go where it wants to go and then you change your infrastructure to let that happen without being flooded. So that would be like a house raised on stilts. And then ecosystem-based adaptation would be maybe like a green solution or a living floor line. And so the purpose of this would be to break up wave energy that occurs before it reaches shore. So it wouldn't have as damaging of effects. So I wanna go over both structural options and non-structural options. And this is just a menu of ideas. These are not necessarily suggestions for Scarborough or Higgins, but uh, broad brush ideas. So structural measures could be elevation, house on stilts, raised roads where they're allowed. It could be a permanent flood barrier. I do have that one crossed out because most of Higgins, we can't have a new flood wall. It could be wet and dry flood proofing. So this could be for a particular structure. Uh, wet flood proofing could be so that water, um, your infrastructure is not damaged by water. So maybe you move your livable space up to the second floor and you convert your first floor to non-livable space. So that allows water to still come, but it's no longer impacting you. Dry flood proofing would be like lining the outside of a building with some sort of like impermeable barrier so that the water doesn't reach the building. Wave attenuation device or WADs as they're known. So these would be manufactured devices offshore which reduce wave energy so that the waves are less damaging as they come towards shore. And then retreat, which I have in both, Structural and non-structural retreat is um, moving away from flood risk. So that would be um, uh, houses that are in flood risk areas, the residents move elsewhere, and then that house becomes non-livable. Non-structural measures. So when we talk about adaptation, there's both adaptation in terms of preventing flooding, but there's also adaptation in terms of increasing your resiliency to flood risk. 
So I'll go through some of these because these are some things that can be implemented sooner because they're not major infrastructure projects. Flood warning systems. So this would be, we know a storm is coming. There is, and I know that Scarborough already does this to some extent. I have seen the fire department's Instagrams where they list out, plan on these roads being closed. But there could be a neighborhood specific flood alert system. So make sure you call your neighbors, get on a text alert system, say it would be, there's a storm coming, we are anticipating the roads being closed. If you um, know that you need to get to medical services because you're 40 weeks pregnant or because you're on dialysis, then plan to not be in this neighborhood. I grew up on Islesboro and that was common standard <laughs> practice. So a storm is coming, we know that the ferry can't run, head over to the mainland because we won't be able to get you there. So there are systems in place in Maine that have already adapted or have had to adapt to things like this. Um, Higgins might become one of those places where we have to be more on top of anticipating those storms coming. Flood emergency preparedness plans. So this would be, um, a town-wide, it could be neighborhood-wide plan for like exactly what could occur as we anticipate a storm event coming. Is it uh, stationing a fire truck in the Higgins Beach neighborhood so that it's already here when the roads get flooded and an emergency happens? We have people here. Um, so it's, it's creating that plan. High water rescue vehicles. These are vehicles that could drive through flooded roadways to rescue people if needed. Temporary barriers or temporary flood walls. So this is kind of structural, but not permanent. So that would be, um, I actually, I have pictures of this later. So we'll talk about that in a bit. A municipal buyout rent back program. So the idea of this is that the municipality would buy a house that is very at risk of flooding, perhaps using a loan, and then they would rent the house back to the person who owned it or to anybody and use that rental income to pay back the loan. And then eventually when the house becomes too at risk of flooding or too damaged, it's no, it would be taken off the market and people wouldn't live there anymore. So it's a strategy for retreat. Uh, dune restoration, so building up the dune system to help attenuate or make those waves smaller, less damaging, and an artificial reef system, so that would be something that's built offshore to attenuate those waves. So I want to talk about the waves at Higgins a little bit. We all know there are huge waves here. It is a surfing destination in Maine. I want to point out this natural system that is already in place offshore in Higgins that reduces those waves. And there is this ledge. So I have two images at various levels of tide that'll show. So we have a ledge here. And you can see how landward of the ledge, we're not seeing these whitewater wave crests the way that we are closer to the where the revetment is at Bayview. And if I go to the next slide, so this is higher tide. So you can see waves are breaking on this ledge that's out there. There's not much wave action happening here because those waves have broken. And the waves are breaking over here on the beach headed towards that revetment where we see the damage. And this is just an example of how there are ways to break up those waves. Um, let me skip forward actually. So there are ways to break up waves. There are um, there are places in the world that have artificial reef systems in order to break up wave energy. These reduce wave energy, they reduce flooding due to wave action, they could potentially reduce flood damage. 
they would not prevent flooding due to just the water level. They would reduce wave action, but if the water is this high, then the water is that high, and that reef system wouldn't bring it down. Um, they could be optimized. They could be designed to optimize surfing conditions or design in order to make sure there's still a surf break somewhere. So it wouldn't necessarily eliminate all of surfing, um, all of the surfing potential. Um, and then going back, dune restoration. So dune restoration is the idea of artificially creating a dune system. So you would do that by um, creating a core of engineer material. So in this example that's shown, there is um, sand filled foyer envelopes. So that is like coconut husk material that's filled with sand. And then sand is placed on top of that. And then planting is placed on top of that. You could also fill a dune with cobbles. Um, you could fill it with, the idea would be to, to fill the inside of the dune with something that's more resistant to erosion from waves and create, build up the dune system. It isn't, um, they are purposefully dynamic. So if you built an artificial dune system, a storm comes and it erodes that dune system. And then you might think we spent all this money on this dune system and now that dune system is eroded. But that dune did its purpose. It broke up that wave action and, and protected infrastructure that's behind it. So dune restoration is allowed in sand dune areas. Temporary flood protection. So here are just some examples. Um, over here, we have tiger dams. So these are temporary structures that could be put up. They are put up across the country, along rivers, in floodplains. Um, we have over here pesco baskets. So these are four foot tall wire mesh baskets that are lined with a uh, like a filter fabric and then filled with like a sand material. So you wouldn't be able to move it once it's in place. It'd be really heavy, but you could install them, fill them up, and they would help reduce flooding up to four feet. They can be stacked. Here, there's actually three layers that goes up to 12 feet. Um, and that would be temporary, although it would be a pretty significant effort to install it temporarily. Uh, flood, deployable flood barriers, and then flood logs are really like specific to a singular building, but it's basically a barricade around the building. So the municipal buyout rent back program, I already described this. So it's one way that you would approach, a, a community could approach the idea of retreat. So what would that act, how could that actually play out? All right, so that is it for the presentation. I'm happy to take questions, but like at the time, I'm happy to take um, 10 or 15 minutes of questions. And then we're going to break out into tables there are more people than we anticipated. So we'll try to do six tables. And at each table, there will be somebody there to take notes and guide a conversation. But the idea will be that we want to hear from you on what your concerns are, what your high level thoughts are for adaptation, what um, your idea, just your ideas in general. What do you value in your neighborhood? What are your main concerns? And then we'll do this for about 20 or 30 minutes. And then afterwards, we will summarize the thoughts and we can have more opportunities for questions and discussions. Yes. So lots of great strategies. So fantastic presentation. Thank you very much for doing this. Um, can you have a multiple, like some places to build a dune, some houses? Yes. Yeah, you can do different things depending like, so if I have a house on the water, that's getting beat up pretty good and I don't want to spend the money to lift it up, I could do the buyback program. Or, yeah, so is that this a case is by case basis or is that? Case by case. And at, this is all just like a brainstorming session. Right. Nothing will actually happen based on this meeting, but it's just part of the process. 
Um, and then some other guidelines. We're going to say kind of the sky's the limit in terms of money for the mm -hmm. ideas we talk about because we want this yeah, to be brainstormy. And we want it to be near term and long term. Um, and like you just mentioned, multiple strategies could be in place. Um, we want to hear the layered thoughts and ideas. Yeah. So for the pilot project, say we come up with some pilot projects. Um, is there any urgency? Because as you probably know, there's in Inflation Reduction Act and those monies are available for coastal communities and they have kind of a timestamp on them. So I'm just wondering what are, um, how quickly we should try to go through this process to access those federal monies that are um, significant, but won't be around forever probably. It's a great question. We haven't even discussed this as the smaller committee that's part of this project. This project will end um, July 2025. Between October and April is when we're slated to identify the pilot projects and bring those forward. And we will be thinking about those in terms of funding that's available um, or how they would be suited to federal funds. Because as you mentioned, there there is quite a bit of state and federal money right now for these types of projects. And we will want to make sure that we're lined up with that. We won't be ready right away, um, but we will be alert to those. Yeah. Are there communities that uh, have already been through this that you would recommend us to go look at that have already done all this that would be an example for us? Uh, there are quite a few communities in Maine that are doing these resiliency studies where Scarborough is right now and that have identified pilot projects. Off the top of my head, I can't think of one where the pilot project has actually gone through to being final designed and built. Although I will say in the town of Scarborough, there are a couple of projects right now that are well on their way to being final design and built. And those would be the Route 1, Route 9 adaptation, um, road adaptation. So that would be elevating both of those roads. And the, um, I don't know how you're framing it, but the, the Sawyer Street. Yeah, Sawyer, closure. Sawyer Street and spur, uh, closure and Spurwing Marsh what restoration. What about other states like Texas or Louisiana or things like that, that they've already been, you know, They've been dealing with this long before we have. Is that an area, an area that you're modeling after any information? Yeah, we are. There are plenty of examples in the country of these projects. Maine is very unique in our tidal range, which is much larger than the tidal range in the South. So the adaptation measures are, um, catered to that a little bit. So when, for example, the reef attenuation system, if your water level varies by one foot once a day, like it does in the Gulf Coast, then the depth of water where you would put that artificial reef system is going to be pretty much the same. But here, where we have 10 foot tides, you have to design the system so that it works at like any given tide cycle. So it has been interesting comparing Maine with other states um, in that sense because of the tides um, and because of federal funding opportunities. Although I will say that Maine has been getting some pretty big federal grants recently and as a state has done a really good job of kind of putting ourselves at the forefront of climate adaptation and it's has been encouraging to see that, but yes, we will be looking at examples and we are have been looking at examples. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm interested in the interplay between private and public. Uh, we live on the far east end on uh, uh, shipwreck. Uh, the story, as far as I understand it, was. Uh, after World War II, uh, there had been a dune built up and they had three lots, which I and our family have. Uh, 
and that's protected by our own uh, seawall, which is uh, crib and box construction, which we are responsible for. But at the same time, we're protecting shipwreck. Uh, can you, uh, I mean, this is the last storm, at, it held for 75 years, uh, it's only been replaced uh, once because of loss and once because uh, over time uh, it was starting to, to show wear and tear. We decided with this most recent storm to replace it, but it's it's all on our, you know, we we have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't know whether you want to address that or whether you want to keep that in mind, uh, but it's crucial to protecting at least the east end of Higgins Beach. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. So this project is really focused on public infrastructure. That being said, there is obviously a lot of private infrastructure here and private seawalls that are in front of individual homes that do reduce the wave action that you would see landward of it. As we look into the future storms, the flooding really starts to come from behind and the sea walls that are on the ocean side will not prevent the flooding that comes around from behind. So they do help in this near term wave action. Um, they won't be that helpful in the longer term flooding. So that being said, when we talk about the flood adaptation in terms of near term, medium term, and long term, which is what you all will be charged with during these breakout sessions, um, that is one idea that we could explore. You know, if we feel that the existing sea walls are pretty crucial in terms of that near term wave reduction, then maybe that's something that the town needs to look at in terms of maintaining their existence of how they are, because like I mentioned, you cannot make them taller. You cannot make new seawalls in a sand dune system. So it could only exist how it is currently. So it does limit the possibility of those moving forward. So with the pump, since the pump is the town, would the town then be doing something to reduce the flooding? So the pump station is owned and operated by the um, Scarborough Sanitary District, which is a separate entity, as I understand, from the town. They are actively involved in this project. They are very aware that their pump station is at risk. We will be doing, as part of this overall project, um, a more detailed field investigation of the pump stations to understand their vulnerability to flooding, um, what actual elevation flooding starts to affect the pump station. So is it um, the first couple of feet, is it flood proof and then there's a window sill where water would come in? So we'll do more of a detailed investigation to understand that risk. And then, and then the hope is that the sanitary district looks at adaptation and that we will, as part of our study, suggest adaptation options for the pump stations that are at risk. Okay. Yes. Is there a um, mitigation option for managing the Spurwink River where the water is coming in and flooding Higgins from the back? It doesn't fit into the dune category, but is there a different category for the river that? Well, it so the river is actually go back. If you look at these maps, <clears throat> this yellow outline is still part of the dune system. So even on that river side of the back side of Higgins is part of that dune dune the designated dune network. How about the river itself? If, if the source of water is coming through the river, is there some way of... Um, so it's not necessarily coming through the river, it's backing up in the river. It's right. still coming from the ocean. 
right. but it then it's backing up around Higgins. Right. Um, so it's mm -hmm. not actually coming down river. It's still um, coastal coming flooding. across the dunes. So it's considered ocean water, not river. But is there a way of looking at engineering the river to help mitigate the damage that's uh, that utilize the river in a way that helps to preserve like a tide flood. gate, for example. Uh, yeah. I I can't say off the top of my head the regulations around that, but I would be surprised if something like a tide gate on a river, especially a marsh, a salt marsh system, would be allowed. Um, the state DP really cherishes the salt marsh systems and strives for full tidal transparency in the system. So not limiting or reducing mm. the tide's ability to get into the salt marsh. But if the marsh is flooded over a period of time, it will lead to the demise of the marsh. Right. If the water doesn't drain off it, it, it just destroys the seagrass and the structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the strategy for the salt marshes in Maine, what environmentalists are striving for um, is, and I'm like scanning the audience if Cressy's here, but she's not, she's not here. Um, the goal is to allow for the migration of the marsh farther upland and to build up, to restore the salt marshes so that they're not, um, they have the ability to grow as seas rise, as the seas rise. So the, the road project that was mentioned earlier um, on Sawyer Street, that also includes a marsh restoration component where um, we will be working to improve the more inland areas of the marsh. Um, and fortunately, a lot of the fringe areas around the marsh is um, owned by Rachel Carson. So there will be areas for the marsh to move. But what's really important for that process to happen is that there aren't any restrictions in the marsh. So that's the transparency that Leela was talking about where the, the water can freely move inland and out so that it can transport the sediment that's needed for the marsh to grow inland um, into the upper reaches of the marsh. So it's kind of two separate separate things, um, addressing, making the, the Spurwink River and the associated marsh more resilient probably won't have that much of an impact on what's happening down here at Higgins. Yes. Two-part question. I understand from attending the uh, town meeting that when pilot programs are selected, not everything's going to be selected. So I'm assuming by virtue of the fact that you're here at Higgins, that we have a pretty good opportunity to be a selected pilot program. But what can we do as a community to lobby for that? So that's part one. And part two, uh, we have, as our association has meetings twice a year with the town. And in the spring, when we uh, met uh, and the uh, beach was gotten uh, ready for the summer with FEMA emergency money, we were advised that to do the mitigation, there's, you know, part two is the mitigation on the beach itself, like some of the seawall. Uh, at the end of Houghton is rolled down and everything that was around the, the uh, and, you know, the sidewalk that was uh, that buckle near the handicap ramp. So we were told there's a separate bucket of FEMA money for that, it's mitigation money. It's a longer, more regulated process and be patient. But I walked away from the public, the town meeting with the understanding that nothing really has been done to, to start that process and perhaps this is part of that process. So if you could, Jamie, you and I've had this conversation too, if you could explain that a little bit and how, you know, what we might, uh, how we might expect that work to uh, get underway. Sure, and Angela, feel free to chime in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, with FEMA funding, it's on a, a 
a cycle. So there are certain times of year when um, that funding can be applied for. Um, and there's often um, kind of two routes you can go. You can kind of go with the national route and compete against um, areas all over the country that are looking for mitigation funds, or you can do a local route where um, you submit um, an interest, like in, a municipality could work with the main emergency management agency um, to basically submit projects that they would like um, allocated as part of the state's FEMA allocation. Um, and there may be an opportunity to get funding that way. So obviously, larger pot of money available nationally, but much more competitive. Um, and so I believe that the, the process is usually in the fall, like now, um, getting a, the letter of interest and things um, into the main emergency management agency or MEMA. Um, and so every it's kind of every fall, there's the initial um, application process. Um, you may be invited to submit a, a full proposal to MEMA. Um, and they will work with their contacts at FEMA to, to kind of pull together the full package and submit it to the federal program for state allocated funding. Um, our uh, fire chief is kind of our designated emergency manager in Scarborough. And so he's kind of the one that oversees a lot of that um, in addition to our um, zoning administer administrator who um, is our also our floodplain manager. Um, and our head code enforcement officer. So they're kind of the two people that are um, most in involved in the, the FEMA funding um, process. And Angela, if yep. you wanna uh, weigh in. Yeah, well, jump in because then that, that, I think what Jamie's talking about is more of like a long-term. So what comes out of this study, we'll be able to kind of put those pieces together and look at um, kind of a master plan, if you will, like looking at some future projects and kind of laying out to your point. We're only going to have the ability under this contract to have so many of these pilot projects, as you mentioned. Um, but I think what Jamie's talking about is what comes out of this study could be a roadmap for us to kind of start picking away at and looking at some other funding alternatives. I think what um, you might have mentioned or referring to was more um, related to the um, emergency funds right after the January storm, where we talked about two pot buckets of money. We talked about there's um, immediate kind of emergency situation, putting things back. Um, and we were trying to put things back as they were. One of the pots or buckets of money that I think Tom Hall maybe is referring to was the mitigation piece is there are some situations where um, we just can't put back what was there before. I think a lot of um, comments we're hearing is around like where the bike racks were to the left of the ramp is that land is gone now. Um, putting that back, there's some rock there. That was one of these emergency kind of temporary measures because we can't put the sand back there because the next high tide's gone um, without doing something more planned, more design, something. Um, and maybe that becomes part of that pilot of what do you do with that area? Um, that's a possibility. We talked about um, Crowd Snack is an example of um, we lost the end of Black Point Road there, and I can't just put a slope back. Um, so that's more going into that mitigation bucket money. And so that's the difference. Um, so so that's still emergency yeah. money? It's still emergency, emergency money, money from the January storm. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. It's still under that declaration from the January storm. So there is the ability to look at if there's, um, like I said, if there's situations where you we just can't put back what was there before without it just being gone. I know we talked about it a little bit too with the Eastern Trail. Um, keep trying to kind of patch that back together, but that again is immediate for that immediate money from FEMA. And then we also need to look at mitigation money from FEMA based on that kind of declaration, that sworn declaration. And so, can I just add too, in case people don't know folks, this is Angela sorry. Blanchett, <laughs> who's our town engineer. Yeah. And this is Jamie Fitch, who is our sustainability manager. And folks from the, their consultants, GEI, right? Yeah. Yes, GEI. And I, there is one question from online and then maybe we will wrap things yeah. up and move on to the yes. breakout. Um, so the question online is, are there examples of um, the tide, the like artificial reef structures that could both block wave energy and generate tidal electricity? That's a great question. Uh, we will need to look into that. 
I don't know. <laughs> but that is definitely something to look And at. if there's not, it would be fantastic. So maybe yeah. we could get yeah. someone working on yes. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for this next piece, we're gonna do breakout tables. Um, I'm gonna ask somebody to help me. I think we'll move these two tables forward a little bit so that we can kind of wrap around them a little bit more. So, Leela, can you stop? And folks online, if you would like to participate in uh, an online discussion, if you would like to break out, raise your hand. Let me actually, I'm going to just get the
Yeah. All right, everyone online, thanks for bearing with us. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, I am going to ask the representatives from each table to give just a brief summary of what was discussed. So I will start. Um, just to share some thoughts of, about anything that came up. So in terms for near-term adaptation, we talked about sandbags for individual homes. So that's something an individual homeowner could do as a way of like a temporary barrier. Um, and then temporary barriers in general. So temporary boulders that could be brought in to help attenuate that wave action where we see the damaging effects, temporary gabions or baskets to help reduce that wave action. Uh, there's concern about public access to the beach and how the beach is very valuable, but there's also concern about are the number of people on the beach um, impacting the dune system and should that be something considered? Um, concerned about groundwater flooding. So as seas rise, that groundwater cable rises and we are, aren't even talking about rainfall flooding, but it's really the trifecta. So that concern in general. When we look into the future, we start talking about strategic planning around selling properties. So when should we sell our properties? Um, but also understanding that that is a huge tax base for the town of Scarborough. And so thinking about that for the town. Um, wave attenuation devices. So we did discuss that and looking at what other countries are doing. So what's the Netherlands doing? What's happening in Venice? Um, and then when we look at 2100, the real main theme that came up was sell retreat. <laughs> so that's it for my table. And then any, I just know some of you might have the same thoughts, but if there's any um, other themes that came up, then Lisa, do you want to go? Um, one of the like near term concerned areas and thinking of adaptation is, you know, the sewer line and the pump station along um, Bayview was just brought up. Um, and we just talked about, you know, maybe potential of removing the seawall with a dune restoration, but, you know, again, thinking that you have that wall, it is doing it what it's meant to do essentially, but bringing in sand and the benefit that that could have to the system. Um, just a question too about municipal buyback, like how you know how would you value the property in that? Would it be a fair market value? Um, just some questions like that. Um, and I did um, mentioned um, like in southern, and this wouldn't necessarily pertain to the spur wink of dredging the spur wink, but the idea of like a community dredge program, like they do with Scarborough, they dredge, and that's the core. But is that something like in the southern main towns they have purchased dredge? Um, equipment and they have they're developing a program that they can dredge and then renourish their beaches that way. So something like that. Scarborough is actually part of that. Pro oh, is program. it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Didn't they do it for a beach last last winter? Yeah, that was done um, through Army Corps. Um, but there, um, there's a group in um, York County and Scarborough because we're part of the Saco Bay um, watershed has um is participating as well they're creating the Saco Bay dredge authority and they received money um to purchase a locally owned dredge because otherwise we are kind of at the mercy of um of army corps schedule so um we'll have a little bit more local control over that it's still in development but they did receive um the funding and the process is moving forward yeah, pretty good awesome um Elon Sure. Um, so our table talked a lot about the sand dune regulations and we were wondering if there's a way to work with DEP to maybe make an exception or change the rules around sand dunes to allow us more wiggle room than what we do in Higgins. Um, and then that's more for near term. Then looking at the 2050 and 2100, we were talking a lot about elevation um, and elevating houses, putting them on stilts, uh, but also being conscious of if you elevate one house the water can just go under it and affect the house behind it. So we have to talk about doing it as a community um, and potentially subsidizing it um, through the town. And then looking far out, you either have to elevate or move. Angela? 
Um, so our group was uh, mainly focused mm -hmm. around um, the river and kind of the um, less, um, our, our group happened to all live in the area um, where the, the flooding is coming from the spurway. Um, so when it, so we focused on that with um, talking about the marsh grasses in the river and slowing that wave action that's coming around um, and so trying to protect some of that. There's some enforcement that might be needed around um, activities that are happening in the river that it may be taking out some of those protective measures that are naturally protecting um, that area and um, talk about the drainage system itself and looking at, like I said, looking at other countries and looking at how there might be pumping systems, not only for sewer, but for storm, storm water and having to um, kind of pumping that out. Um, and then also looking at um, maybe some of the old septic systems. There's a lot of probably abandoned pipes with throughout Higgins Beach and maybe looking at investigating that. And is there is there also water coming back through some of those older pipes. Um, we also um, had a, a conversation around the 1978 storm and there was a federal study done then that mimics exactly what you're showing as here's what's going to happen. And what, what, what transpired after that, it sounds like maybe that's when the sewer system went in, um, but was there additional um, things that were learned in that study that might inform kind of this study as we kind of move forward and kind of piggyback on some of that information? Did I miss anything else? Um, we did talk about the buyback real quickly and saying about then having people live in those houses, some of the environmental concerns with then those properties being damaged and all of that kind mm -hmm. of in either the river or the ocean and kind of mm -hmm. what that means for environmental cleanup, right? Where you know it's coming, this one, next storm's coming. Great, thank you. Emerson? Yeah, um, in the near term, the big theme that came up for my group was kind of doing everything possible to nourish the dune and restore as much of the dune as possible to prevent uh, and kind of replace beach erosion along Higgins. So that's kind of what came up in near term and sort of in easier solutions. Uh, and then some specific things that started coming up uh, towards 2050, um, the pump station. So maybe relocating the pump station, looking for the future um, and how if that's underwater, a lot of the Higgins beach area is livable anymore. Um, also the viability of the buyback program in Scarborough and what the, that would look like. So questions about retreat and you know the viability of that. Um, some other things that came up were moving the utilities to the non-ocean side part, parts of the streets on Bayview, I assume, um, and maybe closing off parts of Bayview and looking at where that can be done, and then like taking the pavement out and restoring the dune there potentially, um, elevating Ocean Avenue where there's the dip in the road and there's been flooding that's already been seen um, because that's a critical access point, and then towards 2100 questions of like fundamental visibility of the community. Mm -hmm. yeah. Man, um, so we had a lot of really great conversation around, um, I would say more like emergency communication within the community. So um, kind of thinking about during these like big flooding seasons, you know, having um, emergency um, agencies like kind of on this side of spur wing, like so they can easily access the area. Um, the fact that Piper Shores has a um, has a road where you can you can leave the <laughs> peninsula of Higgins. There is a gate there though that's operated by Piper Shores, so maybe a relationship or communication with them could help. Um, as well as some of the most of the roads are one ways around here. So for emergencies, can you know everyone go away from the ocean? Um, and then we did talk about, you know, there are um, seasonal uh, residents here. And so in you know what happens if you have long term renters, you know, how do they get the information about flooding and like how to evacuate? And so, you know, having maybe, a separate newsletter for people who are living here seasonally, like in the winter when others are gone. 
um, the sewer system concerns came up because of the erosion has lowered a lot of the lines and they have had experience where trucks have had to come in here and pump out the sewer um, uh, sewer systems and it, it was constant. Uh, rebuilding the sand dunes is a big one. Um, and they did also mention the uh, ocean uh, near Higgins Market where there's about a 200 foot dip. Um, it's outside of the dune zone. So that's a pro, <laughs> um, but raising that. And um, sand build up into the river. This was just kind of an observation of, you know, they can see as the tide comes up, the sand moving. And then when the tide goes back out, that the, you know, elevations of the sand and everything have completely changed, but there's a lot more sand build up from what it used to say for the general things. Great. And were there any online discussions? There were no online discussions. Okay. That's why I was lurking for that entire <laughs> time. <laughs> like, my group went quickly. <laughs> um, okay, so I just want to wrap this up by saying some of the next steps for this project. So um, we will be creating an interactive... Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. So I think we discussed that maybe might be appropriate. Some other people have provided us with some comments. So yes. Maybe we should mention those now as part of this wrap up, if that's all right. Yes. So people who aren't able to be here tonight have filtered their comments through Deb and Chan. So we'd and love to hear those. more comments in the future as well. So mm -hmm. please don't hold back. I, I did hear over the past several months from six people with some of their concerns and they, those have already been expressed. Now, one that I don't think was expressed was the, the, the collection of debris that is produced when the storms are taking out stairs and seawalls and houses and whatever, that, that debris then becomes a problem when it's on private property because the town can't deal with it on private property, but the private homeowner is just suddenly thrust with all this debris. So it seems some solution needs to be sought there. And we do have good photos of that, of all the stairs. I think that was the only one that wasn't okay. part of this transition. Great. And then, Deb, do you have some as well? Um, you know, maybe more specific in, in, is that um, Ben's suggestion, his discussions about the armored report June. So, and then um, I actually had something myself that I, I don't think it was really mentioned, but it came from the 1998 study. And that was taking, looking at um, beach replenishment, the beach, not just the dunes, but beach replenishment and going to the intertidal zone and actually bringing scraping, they call it scraping, and bringing some of that back, because the sand actually migrated down to that end of the beach to bring it back. And I, I don't know if they looked at that from the 98 study and decided it was not a good thing or what happened to it, but I think either put it to rest or you should carry that as something that mm -hmm. should be looked at. It was suggested previously in some other groups that spent a lot of time back in 98 doing a lot of work, so. Yeah. And that just mentioned Tim Bombachi and this community is mourning for his loss. He passed away a few weeks ago and was very involved in looking at the vulnerability and working with the town for several years now. And it's a great loss. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just as, as a private citizen, uh, in terms of sand uh, holding sand and replenishing it two things one is always a battle as far as uh clearing out seaweed particularly during the tourist season where people want to be able to spread their blankets on sand but along with clearing out that sand there are two things i mean clearing out the seaweed there are two problems with that one is uh it takes when they break up the, the seaweed and bring it to the town. There's a fair amount of sand that gets brought that way. Also, the seaweed is a great holder of sand in, in place. 
So that's one issue. The other is um, a lot of sand. I'm, I'm not sure how much sand gets brought up the spurway and over time, how much has been there and uh, is the Corps of Engineers available to dredge sand out there? I mean, uh, we don't need it for navigation, but uh, that's another source of sand that has gone back and forth from the beach and then uh, a certain type of tide gets brought up into the river and doesn't come back. Yeah, I made a note of those because I think they're important to look into. Um, uh, the beach nourishment is definitely something that we will look into as part of this project. There is a natural movement of sand with the seasons that occurs. Um, it is costly to do beach nourishment and it can be demoralizing when you do it and then a storm comes and moves that sand away. That doesn't mean that it doesn't help during that storm, but it is the cost of maintaining that is something that needs to be considered. Yeah, well, one of the things different. our yeah. table talked about with the beach nourishment was you have to be really careful with the sand, because if you don't like one of the, you know, qualities of Higgins Beach is the quality of its sand. And if we bring in outside sand, it's actually going to ruin the beach and what everyone cherishes about the beach. So you just have to be careful about these beach nourishment. You know, if you're like taking it from the river and using the same, you know, could work. But if you're going to bring in outside sand from, you know, someplace else, that's yeah. probably, you know, you just have to be really careful. And there's tons of examples up and down the eastern seaboard of beaches ruined because of beach nourishment because they didn't, you know, they didn't take into all these factors and now their beaches are ruined basically. Right. And, and also when, when we're doing this and talking about doing restoration, um, it's my understanding from hearing Peter Savinsky's speech, I mean, once you have a seawall in place, you're, there's no doom to restore. So really with the exception of the dune that's down near the river, there's only one little tiny patch of dune that's near Pearl Street, you know, then Pearl Street and Ryan Street. So I don't know that you can restore dune in front of the seawall. So. Yeah. Yeah, as we, as these ideas are moved forward, the viability of them will be something that we look into. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Just to follow up on my comment, it doesn't seem to me that it's going to cost anything to leave CB. Oh, right. The CB, no. I was talking about sand. To educate people that yeah. uh, to come to Higgins Beach. Uh, Don't move the CB. That, that, that's part of the beach. And if <laughs> yeah. you want to have a nice, clean place, you can bring your own rake and move it to the side, but don't take it off with all the other things yeah. where a lot more gets dragged out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there are some general kind of best management practices that can go into beaches and keeping dunes or not damaging dunes or keeping sand in place. And that's a, that's a low cost um, framework to put together. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's a kind of a controversial subject. Personally, you know, yeah. we, we rake the, the once a week. You can take it off the thing, so it's a pleasurable experience for people who are spending ten thousand dollars a week to stay here. So, and then the, my understanding is it comes back to the beach at the end of the season or something. Like that. I don't really know, but um, you know, I think that's a separate subject. Yes, because I can't imagine there's that much sand that's caught up in it. I'm not saying it's not a good thing to consider, but I'm just wondering. Yeah, it's not a priority today. There's so many other things. Yeah, and that will have a my own personal opinion has a negative impact to the quality of the sun. Yeah. Voices drop. I couldn't wait yeah. back to It's just a controversial subject. Yeah. Up with it. <laughs> so you don't want us to hear? <laughs> okay, I'm going to wrap up um, and talk about next steps. So there will be an interactive online story map that summarizes this project and the results that will be available early next year. Um, the pilot 
project selection and design will take place over this winter and early spring. And this project as a whole will be finished um, July, end of July, hopefully the end of July. And um, there will be another meeting just like this in a couple of weeks or two or three weeks uh, for the Pine Point neighborhood. Um, and then there will be a final public meeting, probably early summer, late spring, as a wrap up to this project. Can, can you just um, maybe touch on the pilot project selection? Because um, one of the things that was asked here was about um, prioritizing projects. And I know, I guess I wanted to just reiterate that we have a defined scope and only so much money in our capital improvement project for this study. So that's why we're kind of like, there will be a few, um, but we're looking at maybe as far as kind of constructability, ease of permitting, costs. I'm sure there's other things that kind of looking at a matrix of things mm -hmm. um, or even how quickly we could get it done sort of thing. Um, if it's a five-year pilot, you know, for us to get a pilot project in might not be feasible under the study, but it doesn't mean it's not a good project. Right. Mm -hmm. So I just want to kind of make sure we kind of think that through and that'll go through the stakeholder group, right? As far as yeah, so kind of helping us fine tune get there. Yeah, we will. I think how it will work is that we consultants will come to our oversight committee, which has representatives from the Higgins Beach neighborhood with an initial thought of here's what we think would be good pilot projects for the entire town. They will likely be heavy hitters in terms of many people are at risk and adapting this piece of infrastructure will have a large benefit to many people. Um, it could be the, we think this is easily permitted, could be designed in a year and good to go. There'll be many things that come into play. And then we'll have discussions with the committee to refine that. As part of our scope, we said there would be three to five projects. It depends on what those projects are, how large they are, and the um, amount of design that would be involved because some projects will be smaller than others. So there'll be a little bit of a back and forth and then when those are finalized, I guess we will somehow, well, the committee will know and that will get back to anybody interested. I have a question though. You had raised a question a bit, the access to money mm. from the program. Can you raise that again? Because I think that was really helpful to hear that really it's a, okay, so now you have a sense of urgency to something that's a little more critical. It's outside the scope of what you're hired to do, but is there someone else? What was your question point? Well, my point was there are these federal monies that are gonna that are on a bit of a short fuse. So it'd be great if GIE had a task that said evaluate IRA funds available for the town that could, you know, pick up some more money because that money isn't gonna be available forever. Yeah. And other monies are available because, you know, they're all for coastal climate resilience. There's lots of money. Yeah. And, it, you know, Scarborough is in a perfect position to access, you know, because we have all the problems that a lot of those monies are um, geared to um, address, essentially. And I don't want to leave money on the table just because no one looked. <laughs> no, it's a really good point. And, you know, we actually, as a company, recently brought on somebody who is a specialist in just grant programs across mm -hmm. the country. Um, and she would be a good resource. I'm just making a note to myself for this, for this project, just to make sure we're not missing any big deadlines. And we try to stay aware of those and our projects are all in various stages. So some could be lined up to get money this year. Or some could, it would maybe be, you know, the next round of funding but we certainly don't want to miss those opportunities. Can you introduce the Higgins Beach representative to your work group? Yes, so the Higgins Beach representatives are Deb and Chan. <laughs> so reach out to them. They can funnel your concerns or thoughts back to the committee. Your contact information has been on the email last but don't feel you have to go through us. You can also yeah, go, go directly to Jamie. You can go directly to Jamie. <laughs> 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 
All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.